I'm Victor Levidus, I'm a researcher at uh, Adifis, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you the speaker of this afternoon, Meisan Akbar Sadeh. Uh, so he's assistant professor at uh, Isfahan uh, University of Technology in Iran. He's visiting us for a month, so you still have, uh, I mean, you're interested, you still have a chance to talk with him, and he's staying next week, yes. probably still Wednesday. Yes. And uh, so, Basically, he has done his PhD in, in the States, in Louisiana State University. He has to uh, give you a little bit of, the, of his background. It's dynamic root choice in hurricane evacuation. Um, his uh, research interests are urban complex networks, traffic flow modeling, crowd dynamics, public transportation. We have many overlaps with the research we are doing here and with the topics of the, of the school. And the only note I, I wanted to make today is that, well, typically you are very familiar with uh, physicists that work in fields that are different from physics, right? So physics is talking about how biology works or how social systems work, and uh, you are very comfortable with that and uh, very used. In this case, it's just the opposite. So he has not a background in physics, but in engineering. And he's gonna, I mean, he was very interested in, in complex networks in particular, and he asked himself what can, I mean, how complex networks can be useful in his field, in, in, in transportation networks. And uh, so this is just, uh, I think it's a very, interesting and complementary view to what uh, we are more uh, used to. And, uh, and I think just that we can uh, welcome uh, Pesar Habarsedat for uh, his talk and well, the title is to come. But it's an application of complex network methods to urban transportation network analysis. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Victor, for introducing me. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending my lecture. Uh, the good news to begin with is that my lecture is going to be an easy one since, uh, as Victor suggested, I'm a beginner in this complex network. And uh, I'm open to your suggestions and critics and uh, everything that you may have to say. I'll try to uh, keep it to 40, 45 minutes to have some time uh, for uh, extra discussion and taking your feedback. Uh, application of complex networks um, are found in uh, transportation networks as well. I'm going to talk about some of the uh, things that I've been doing myself, in which uh, sometimes uh, may uh, not be all of it or cover all the area, but uh, I think it's a good point to, to start with uh, here right now. Uh, uh, probably you are uh, familiar with different uh, uh, transportation networks. Uh, some of the uh, examples are uh, mentioned here. Uh, you can see them. Firstly, I would like to mention that uh, transportation networks or transportation system is part of a greater system uh, which builds uh, the modern society. You can see the power system, the, the gas system or the energy system, the water system, telecommunication system and transportation system. Every day and every year they are more interconnected with each other and integrate, inter integrated with each other. Um, um, there are lots of uh, links going back and forth between these layers. As, uh, and uh, you may uh, think that if one of these layers fails, the others will also fail sooner or later. So here's the transportation system. Uh, you need to move people from their residence to their work, to shopping, and uh, uh, vice versa. Um, and also you need to move goods from where they are produced to where they are going to be consumed. So that's mainly what the transportation networks do. Um, focusing on the layer of transportation network, you may also have some layers within the layer. For example, what you have here, which is uh, um, brought from the paper I mentioned here, which is the public transportation of London, uh, consisting of bus, metro, and rail. Each of them have their own stations, here noted as nodes, and their segments and routes. Um, denoted by links. And there are also interlayer links connecting uh, the bus system to metro system, which are transfer stations. And uh, rail to metro, rail to bus, and uh, all of these, which are the public transportation, are connected to the private transportation or the road network. Um, the map here shows the, um, the global map of uh, cargo shipping throughout the world. Uh, lighter links are the mo ones uh, more traversed by cargo ships, and the darker ones are the ones that are less traversed. Um, here you see an, uh, a typical urban road network. Um, the purple 
links are the uh, more congested ones, then are the yellow ones, and then are the green ones, which are less congested. It, the, the network is put in perspective. So here we have a weighted and directed network. As you get close to the city center, in, in this particular example, you see more congestion, which is the case in many different cities. And very recent uh, and uh, basically complicated networks are the networks um, which are established based upon the connection of uh, connected vehicles. V2V system, which has been introduced in the technology. If um, you know that these cars or, or the modern cars can be connected to each other and uh, transmit messages about their uh, status and their speed and acceleration and uh, even the situation of the driver and their driving history uh, to help others uh, have a better traffic maneuvers. Um, if you assume each of these as a node and their connection um, and data transmission as a link, then you will get a, um, a network which is highly dynamic. Every now and then, nodes enter the system and get out of the system, and also links are established and removed. Um, so this is also a network which uh, could be connected to transportation. Um, this map coming from this website uh, shows uh, um, all that happens in the structure and topology of transportation systems. Uh, urban areas are denoted by uh, yellow points, and then uh, you see these green uh, lines going all over the place, which are the roads. Uh, you see these uh, blue links, which are the shipping routes. And you see the gray ones, uh, which are the air network, uh, all uh, gathered in one uh, uh, map, uh, which uh, very well shows that uh, we are dealing with a, a large network and a complex one. Um, I'm more focused on, uh, on urban networks. So what I'm going to start with is how to abstract an uh, urban uh, road system as a network. Um, there's an approach called primal approach. Um, suppose this is part of your city. Uh, these are the houses and alleys between them, and these are the roads. If you uh, assume each intersection to be a node like this, and two nodes be connected if there is a link connecting them in the real ground, you will end up with a graph or a network. This is called the primal approach, and this is where I actually start my um, discussion. Um, there's another approach, which is called the dual approach. Uh, I'm not using it that much, but uh, it's there in the literature. And uh, it's based on assuming links as roads, actually, as nodes and uh, connecting those nodes if the corresponding roads are connected in an intersection. So this is how it works. This road is uh, notified by this node. This road is notified by this road node. And these two are connected beca because their corresponding roads intersect at an intersection. This is called the dual approach. Uh, as I said, I'm not uh, going to use this, but um, some people use it, and it has some merits in it, which is not uh, related to my topic. But anyway, what I'm going to uh, focus on is these three uh, topics. One is detecting the vital nodes of uh, um, urban road networks. The second one is uh, the application of community detection, which I will just pick up um, a few points in it and not go deep through it. And also uh, some modifications that we have been able to do to um, network of buses in uh, our own uh, city uh, to improve its um, structure. Uh, these four uh, plots that you see here are the histograms of node flows of four real cities. So the values are real. And uh, um, you can see that uh, it's Isfahan, my hometown. Uh, and it's Winnipeg in Canada, Barcelona, and Anaheim in US. Uh, cities are of different sizes. Um, and uh, what you can see is that um, they are not basically uh, following a certain distribution. But we, what we can see here is that there are a few nodes with high flows 
and lots of nodes with low flows. Although it's not following a power law, but uh, the hierarchy could be seen here. The hierarchy, I mean that you have some local roads, and then you have collectors and distributors, and then you have your arterials and highways, which uh, um, attract the, the most traffic. So the values are real, but uh, normalized uh, for each city. Um, I talked about uh, detecting the vital nodes or important nodes. Um, I will use that interchangeably. But uh, we need to determine that important in what sense. Uh, as uh, most of you are familiar with uh, different uh, applications of complex networks, you can um, easily see that um, these that I have listed here are some of the um, aspects or applications that uh, complex network methods are used in. Uh, you may work in epidemics, then uh, probably you will uh, be looking for uh, nodes or people uh, or entities that uh, if are vaccinated, the whole system is best and most efficiently vaccinated. Um, just, just as an application, not the whole, not the whole problem. Um, in information spreading, you may have rumors uh, spreading in, in your communities and societies, um, or facts being spread. And um, some of the Sure. Okay. And, uh, um, one of the topics uh, of interest to, to scholars especially is how the, um, the academic facts are being cited among different journals, who cites from who, and which are the most central journals um, in the literature. Uh, the third example could be viral marketing. You have a certain number of free samples you want to distribute to the people who will um, best um, actually um, spread your message or the quality of your goods. You cannot give free samples to everyone. So you need to detect the people that are most influential uh, in terms of word of mouth. So um, those are the important nodes of your, of your network. Um, and the, the fourth example would be the robustness and resilience of networks or systems which is the main focus of my uh, research here. Uh, but when you talk about robustness and resilience, which I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail about them, is uh, the flow security versus structural connectivity. You may focus on the structural connectivity. Um, it means that um, for the minute being, forget about what is happening on the network, who is going from where to where, and just look at the network itself and uh, try to find important nodes in uh, maintaining the connectivity. Uh, I'll go into more detail about that. But sometimes you not only care about the structural aspects, you also care about flow. Um, who is going from where to where? It's like uh, looking at the road network and at the same time looking at the trip and pattern of trips that people have. Who goes at what time from where to where by what means? car, bus, etc. So this is the flow security. And the second subsection of robustness and resilience is the static versus dynamic robustness. When we talk about the static robustness, usually percolation approach is adopted. You uh, start uh, um, evaluating nodes one by one, either remove them or add them or whatever. Suppose you remove a node and then see what happens to the whole functionality of the system. Then you remove the next one, the next one, and so on and so forth. Um, you may uh, evaluate the phase transitions or what uh, basically happens to the whole network in terms of its functionality. This is the percolation approach. But sometimes you look at the dynamic robustness, uh, which is uh, mainly called the cascading failure. When a node is failed, um, what it used to do would be distributed on other nodes. So others have to take the burden of the removed node. So some of the new nodes may be extra loaded, and they start failing again. And this will spread in the network. So this is called the cascading failure. And the, the other name for it is evaluating the dynamic robustness of the network. The cascading failure has mainly been uh, discussed in uh, power networks, which, uh, which is uh, very common. Um, but we have also started working in, in, on it in uh, urban transportation networks on how delay propagates throughout the network 
when a, an intersection fails or is overly congested. Uh, so I'm going to focus on structural connectivity and we'll adopt a percolation approach. Okay. Um, um, let's have a, a small introduction of resilience and the robustness. Uh, assume a system like a city or, or whatever system you're more familiar with. First, um, um, you can imagine that the system is devised to achieve a goal. And that goal could be quantified by a measure or an index. That index is called critical functionality. Some of the examples are given here. Relative size of the joint component or the connected component of the system. Nodes that are connected to others. That you can find a path to travel to other nodes. Or it could be travel speed, um, which uh, denotes the or represents the mobility in a city. You have an um, urban road network and you want people to move on it. So the speed is important. And the higher the speed, the more uh, functional your system could be assumed. So travel speed could be called a critical functionality. You have to choose one of them, basically. And the number of successful trips could also, in especially disastrous situations, be um, perceived as a critical functionality. So you, you, as, you assume one of them, which is the most important for you. And um, um, I'm not going to actually discuss these formulas. These are just there for those who are interested. But um, I'll explain things uh, qualitatively. Now, suppose something happens to your system right here. Um, first, you have your critical functionality as its uh, standard value, which you assume to be 1. Assume everything is normalized. Then something happens. A failure happens, or a stress is imposed to your system. The system starts absorbing the stress. By absorb, we mean it's, it starts diminishing in terms of its critical functionality. It absorbs and comes to here. Two things may happen. If your system is resilient, at some point, it will start going back. It means that its critical functionality will start improving. But if your system is not resilient, the fall of the critical functionality will continue until it dies out. So if it's not resilient, it will eventually die out. But assume that it's somehow resilient. So it returns. You may help it to return, or the internal mechanisms may, be, may become active to, to return. But uh, the point is that at some point, it will return. And then uh, it will go back up to to a situation close or at exactly where it used to be before the express was imposed. Um, each uh, stage has a name. And also, you could discuss the, um, the equations of these uh, curves here, which is what people do in, in different systems. Oops. Sorry. So the equation here and the equation of curve here. But there are two um, definitions given here. First is the area of the gray, of, of the green uh, section. And uh, the second is this height here. The first one, which is the area, is called the resilience. The smaller the smaller the green area is, more resilient your system is. Or on the, on the other, other side, the greater the area of the yellow part is, more resilient your system is. The whole area is 1 times 1. And uh, when the green area is small, it means that your system either hasn't deviated much from its original state or has come back soon. So it's resilient. And, uh, what is the robustness? Robustness um, measures how much you deviate from your standard critical functionality when the stress was imposed on your system. So this is the minimum you get here. And uh, this is robustness. The more you are distant from the zero critical functionality, the more robust you are. 
Uh, what I mean using is the relative size of giant component for urban road networks for the first. Yes, yes it does. But suppose the stress is uh, the same and you are testing different systems. But it, it depends on the stress and where you put the stress. Okay. Um, there have been lots of criteria um, introduced for detecting the, the important nodes. Um, you may, uh, as I said uh, previously, you may focus on a structure and you may focus on function or, or work on both. The point here is that at least in, in transportation, a structure and function are not totally separated. Although are not totally correlated, but not separated. So there's a somehow complicated relation between them, which I will show you the, the plots that uh, I've prepared. But uh, what, uh, what happens could be um, explained using this chart here. People need to move so the roads are built. People need to move, demand, so the roads are built, supply. But after the roads are built, you have more accessibility to the places that were not connected to you before. So you start going there more and more. And businesses start developing on, on the sides of the roads because people can, can go there. So accessibility improves. When accessibility improves and more shops are being located there and more businesses are launching there, people start going those places more and more. So demand exceeds. When demand exceeds, there is congestion. And when there is congestion, city planners need to supply more roads. And these loops go uh, on and on until they get to an equilibrium, which is an urban equilibrium. Uh, so demand, which is the, the functional or the dynamics or the trips. And the supply, which is the topology of the network, um, give birth to each other. Another choice you have to make is that whether you want to select your nodes one by one or just, uh, or you want to pick a set of important nodes. If you want to uh, pick them one by one or individual selection is what you prefer or fits your problem, then uh, you can look at centrality measures which could be divided into neighborhood-based um, centralities or path-based. Neighborhood ones like degree, look at the local neighborhood of a node and don't care much about the paths that pass a node. On the other hand, path-based, uh, don't look at the local neighborhood, but um, care about the paths that, uh, that go through each, each node. So between this and degree are, are, are two um, famous ones. There have been lots of discussions about, um, about degree and other centralities. Um, one of them is here. Um, many, many discussions are there, but only one of them is reported here um, from Liu and, uh, and uh, his uh, co-authors, uh, which show that degree alone may not be able to grasp the importance of, of nodes. You see these two yellow nodes here. Both of them have degree two, but one of them, if disconnected, won't hurt the network that much. The other one, if disconnected, will uh, disconnect a whole community from the rest of the network. Uh, although both of them have degree equal to two. Anyway, the second approach is the set selection in which you select a set of important nodes all at once. This is an NP-complete problem or NP-hard problem. Um, and the point here is that uh, every node has a, um, has a, re a realm of, or a region of influence. When it's removed or when it fails, those areas that are considered to be the influence area of the node are influenced by its removal. Um, and nodes may have common areas of influence. So when you remove them one by one, some part of the area of influence of a node may be already taken by failure of the previous node. But when you take all of them at, the, at a certain point, 
then, then this problem may not arise. So you will get a better answer, but it comes at a cost. Um, so my approach will be individual selection, which is basically the main um, idea in, in, uh, in percolation approaches. Uh, just to remind you some of the centralities, betweenness centrality is, uh, is the portion of shortest paths that uh, Okay. Closeness uh, captures the distance, geodesic distance you have to all other nodes of the network. Eccentricity is the maximum distance you have with all other nodes of the network, um, which um, we will come back to. And the connected component, in case if, if anyone is not familiar, is a subgraph in which any two nodes are connected by at least one path. Uh, some basic uh, reminders. Okay. Now, one of the problems uh, or the questions we wanted to address in urban road networks was uh, the aspect of scale freeness. Scale free networks are quite common or, um, and uh, widely investigated in the literature. So, we started uh, looking at the aspects of uh, urban road networks. Here we have eight networks Anaheim, Austin, Berlin, Birmingham. Chicago, Gold Coast, Esfahan, and Philadelphia from different continents. Um, there are lots more, but uh, we suffice to these eight because I can show the results for these eight. What you see here is that uh, the distribution of degrees do not suggest um, the property of uh, power law. Firstly, only limited number of degrees could be witnessed in urban road networks because uh, a node is an intersection. And uh, you know, you may have four, five, at most six roads connected to an intersection. If you take it as a directed node, uh, as a directed network, then you will have at most 12 links connected to a node. So there is no, there is no power law fitted anyway. Um, and you see different types of uh, discrete distributions of, of nodes here. So detecting the uh, the characteristic of scale-free is impossible in urban road networks. So we started investigating the distribution of other centralities. We tested many of them, and then we found that betweenness centrality is uh, distributed um, like power law in the cities, at least in the cities we investigated. And it was interesting. It means that you have uh, a very few number of nodes with high centrality and very large number of nodes with low centrality. Um, some of the figures are here. You can see the linear the log log uh, plot here. Uh, and the numbers, which are uh, too small to be read, uh, reported in a paper that we, we published in Applied Network Science. So what we found was that uh, between the centralities were distributed uh, power law. But the difference with the scale-free network was that, as you may know, in the scale-free networks, uh, targeted attacks can ruin or devastate the network very easily. You just pick the nodes with high degree and remove them, and the whole network disintegrates. But random failures or random attacks do not have that much effect because the number of nodes with high degree are so small, which there's not much chance of hitting them in a random attack. But that's not the case in, uh, 
in urban road networks. So we are receiving a mixed message. Although the, the betweenness centrality follows a power law, but it does not suggest that removing nodes with highest betweenness would disintegrate the, the network very fast. And this is because of lots of redundancies you have there. If you miss an, a node or an intersection or a road, there are lots of others who can catch up and compensate for that. So for eight cities, for some of them, you see that the red uh, curves are the, um, are the size, relative size of the giant component by removing the nodes. For some of the cities like Birmingham, the red one is the most influential one, or for Chicago. So for these two cities, removing the nodes with highest between the centralities will have the most effect on failure of the network, but not for the others. For, every, for each of them, something different is important. So we are half scale-free and half not. And depending on what criteria you uh, select for detecting your vital nodes, different nodes will be in the list. And you see, in, uh, in urban road networks, when you want to find the important nodes or important intersections, you want to invest on them. You want to take care of them. You want to give the traffic a priority in passing through them. So you cannot um, select l many number of, uh, of your uh, intersections because you have a limited budget. Or you want to widen them, you can't do that to all of your intersections. So you need to pick, uh, due to f f uh, fiscal limitations, you have to pick a small number of your intersections. But the problem here is that um, depending on what criterion you select, a different set of nodes are selected. And for one city, you see the blue ones are highest capacity, the green ones are highest flow nodes, and the red ones are highest between this centrality. So the results would suggest that uh, no one measure can uh, grasp the whole importance in urban road networks. What we did then was to introduce the collective influence, which is recently brought up by uh, Moran and Max in their letter published in Nature. Um, this is the formula, which is quite simple to follow. And uh, these are what they have uh, plotted in their uh, paper on the right half of the slide. And the competence of uh, collective influence is the catching the nodes, which are called weak nodes, with low degree but at the, same kind, at the same time, connecting high degree or important communities to each other. Like the one they show here, the degree is, uh, let's say, free, but it is connecting some important communities to each other. So it grasps something that uh, degree cannot grasp. Here's the formula. Um, reduced degree of a node is multiplied by the sum of the reduced degree of its neighbors. What neighbors? Neighbors at the um, layer of the ball. And the ball, as shown here, consists of uh, nth neighbors of the node under investigation. L is the radius of the ball. You could play with L. L equal 1 gives the immediate uh, neighbors of a node. L equal 1 means those nodes that are immediately connected to your node. L equal 2 means those nodes that are at the distance of exactly 2 to your node. Um, and here in this, uh, in this uh, plot, you see L equal 3 being shown for this node I. 1, 2, 3. And when you um, <coughs> work with these balls, you only pick the nodes that are located on the layer of the ball. So only those that are exactly 3 links apart from the node not the nodes that are within the ball. They're not in the play. Um, an interesting thing that we found out, these two figures are ours, is that uh, as you increase the L, the value of collective influence, or CI, increases uh, linearly. It happens in, uh, in urban networks, and it also happens in, in some other networks. But, but what we focused on was urban networks, 
And we have uh, plotted that L equal to 1 all through the 10 for six different cities. And as you can see here, slopes are different, but the linear behavior can be very well witnessed. So um, these are the six cities that we were concentrating on. Mm, we calculated the correlation or the Pearson correlation of uh, different centrality measures shown here. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you see the ball radius as you increase the L. What happens to the correlation of each of these four centralities with the uh, collective influence? Clustering coefficient is the triangles uh, in the bottom. So their correlation is not much, but as you increase the L, they still remain there. For betweenness, Correlation is, uh, is low, and L doesn't help it. But uh, for degree and communicability, the correlation um, is, is high, especially when the ball radius is 1. But increasing L decreases the correlation. So as the L increases, co collective influence has more things to say, which is not grasped by uh, degree and not grasped by communicability. All the six cities. Except for one. They were similar except for one. No, I think it was Esfahan itself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, the behavior was similar, except for one of them. And the one uh, was, uh, I think, uh, the difference was in degree, would show a jump in the correlation between CI and degree at ball radius equal to 6. Probably. There was a jump here, and then it came back. So the, the others, the behavior was the same, but the numbers were different. And uh, we were looking for the behaviors to see how it, how it works. Um, so we, um, we started sorting the nodes based on their collective influence and between this centrality and enhanced collective influence, which is a, um, a different version introduced in the literature, which I'm not going to discuss um, due to my time limits. But anyhow, as you can see here, um, Firstly, the behavior of collapsing urban networks is, is, uh, is of interest. You see an inverse sigmoid behavior here, uh, which was repeated in the, in the previous slides as well. First, by removing the first portion of nodes, uh, you um, see a low slope here. And then it suddenly starts breaking apart. And then when you have lost everything and have a small giant component, then everything again gets flat. Something like a, a mirror shape of an S, or inverse sigmoid, let's, let's call it. Um, here what you can see is that, again, um, we are not witnessing uh, uh, a ubiquitous picture. Uh, we can't say which of these uh, three uh, criteria of importance better disintegrates the network. So in terms of relative size of giant component, we have no answer to the question. So we went to the efficiency to see what we can do. Um, efficiency is the sum of the reciprocal of uh, path, paths connecting a node to all other nodes. Uh, again, here you can see that um, um, although some of them, like CI, is uh, really functioning good, but not in all cities. You see the, uh, the green line? It, uh, for at least five of the cities, it disintegrates the network more rapidly than others. But for, for city number one, the case is different. But we came to conclude that CI has a merit, at least in some of the cities. 
and it's not that, con uh, that correlated to other centralities. So let's give it a try. And what again we see here is that um, for uh, selecting the importance criterion based on between the centrality or collective influence or enhanced collective influence, you will have three different sets of important nodes. This is Philadelphia, this is Esfahan, Birmingham, and Berlin. Um, try to look at the green dots and the navy dots and red dots. Each of them belong to the CI, ECI, or BC. You can see that uh, each of these centrality measures show a different set. So it reiterates the conclusion that we got from the uh, the previous study of ours that if you want to select the important nodes of an urban network, you need to use more than one measure. You need the combination of measures, which we are working on, which we are working on to, to pick it. But we have not concluded yet. Uh, another thing, okay, that, that topic is done. Now we go to, uh, to the second uh, topic, which is the relation between flow and betweenness. We talked about the structure, we talked about topology, but let's see what, how this topology is uh, related to the dynamics of the network. Um, what you see is uh, the normalized betweenness of nodes plotted uh, versus their normalized flow. This is plotted for Anaheim, Barcelona, Isfahan, and Winnipeg because we had data for these four cities. We needed flow data. Um, what you see here firstly is that uh, most of the nodes have low betweennesses. That's because of the, the power law distribution of the betweennesses that I talked about. So most of the nodes are below 50% in all four cities. We already talked about that. Another thing is that when your flow is high, you can't say anything about the betweenness. The nodes with high flow may have low betweenness, may have high betweenness. This is the case in all four cities. When, when a, a, a node has a low flow, you may guess that probably its betweenness is not high. But when it has a high flow, which comes to the right part of the plots, then you can't say anything. It's, it's so dispersed. Um, and, and this is an interesting message, which uh, we are also working on, how to establish the relation between the a topologic centrality like betweenness, which is a path-based one, and a flow which is actually happening on the network. OK. Um, it's already 3.47. You want me to continue or? Okay. Shall I continue or? Okay, sure. Um, we had a small look at the modular structure of networks. In some of the networks, having a modular structure is an advantage. Um, when a disease is spreading in a network, a network of a species or human beings, if you have a modular structure, it helps you vaccinating people. You just pick those on the border, vaccinate them, and then the whole community is vaccinated. But not in urban networks. In urban networks, having a modular structure or having a community structure means that you have certain bottlenecks. You have certain areas in the city that uh, part A and part B are not that well connected to each other. So if something happens to those links or those nodes, some part of the city will become disconnected, like bridges, a system of bridges over a, a river, very well disconnect a, a certain part of the city from the others. So having a modular structure of networks, uh, uh, structure of networks in urban context is not an advantage. Um, what we did uh, to one of the cities, which happens to be Esfahan itself, um, was to mm, detect the uh, communities of the city. We used InfoMap because it fitted better uh, the 
characteristics of our network. And uh, the modular structure, or, or let, let's say the, the communities and uh, their structure depends on the weight you give to your links. This is the first point. So if you use unweighted version of the link, you get the leftmost picture. If you use capacity as the weight, as the UC2 nodes are more connected in an urban context, if a wide uh, highway is connecting them, than a two-lane road. So capacity plays a role. Um, inverse of L, or the link length, if, uh, if two points are not that much distant from each other, they are more connected. So it's reciprocal of L. And the reciprocal of travel time. These are what we use as uh, uh, link weights. Uh, and then a adopted percolation approach for one of these systems, let's say unweighted. We see that uh, comparing to congestion, flow, and betweenness, being located on community border very well captures the vitality or importance of a node. Um, you may have lots of uh, overly congested um, links or nodes, doesn't matter. Here it's about links. Um, but if the congested links are uh, blocked or um, due to uh, intolerable delay or, or assumed to be blocked, not much happens to the network. If the links with high flow are blocked, not much happens. Between us, not much happens. But if the links connecting those communities are blocked for any reason, the network easily disintegrates. And uh, the final part is what we did to the bus network of, of Esfahan. Um, this is the histogram of the um, node degrees, which is the number of lines passing each station. For uh, abstraction of a transit network, there are uh, few ways introduced in the literature. And uh, each approach is called a space. You have line space, you have bipartite space, and connectivity space, and others. Suppose you have a small system of three lines, uh, a blue line, red line, and green line. Um, L space assumes that each station is a node, and two nodes are uh, connected by a link if at least one line passes through them, and they are located on the same segment. Line goes from node I to node J. B space assumes each uh, line as a node and also each station as a node. So that, that's how it makes it bar part height. And uh, all the nodes locating on a line are connected to their uh, corresponding um, line node. P space just connects all the nodes that are connected or located on a, on a, on a certain line. We are not dealing with it any, anymore. But the C space, which is on our focus, assumes each line as being a node. So you have line one, node one. Line two, node two. And line three, node three. And these nodes are connected if there is a transfer station between them in the city. You see there's E and F to, be, to transfer from line green to line red. So one is connected to two. And C and A can be considered as transfer stations of line blue and line red. So these are also connected. But two and three don't find any transfer stations, so are not connected. We built the C space of the bus network of Isfahan and then calculated the eccentricity. And eccentricity is the distance you have to the most distance node of the network. In C space, it means the uh, maximum number of transfers you need to take for going from node A to node B throughout the city. Um, so we picked the, the nodes with largest eccentricity, which meant lines that needed more number of, the most number of transfers for traveling throughout the city. And transfers really, really bother passengers. So we focused on them and played with the network with this um, limited number of stations, relocating them, adding stations, or, uh, or doing things like that, or adding 
um, transfer stations just to uh, shift the distribution of eccentricities to the left. And this is what we have achieved. The blue dots are after what we have done and the red dots are before what we did. So we achieved to uh, move it or shift it to the left a little bit. You have less eccentricity, which means that on average you have uh, less transfers to take for uh, doing your travel by bus, which may increase the utility of uh, public transportation against the public against the private one. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Well, actually, is uh, an won't be a um, technical question, but more. Um, let's say um, social political question and are you um, do you think uh, that this data and this research you are doing will be used to will be useful for some uh, 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 policy makers uh, uh, advocacy or something like that well it depends on the uh, on the on the local area you're working on you have cities that are being developed in those cities, you have the best chance of getting into the policy making and give them hints. There are uh, cities which are uh, already uh, matured, not, not, not much things uh, changing there. Uh, those are the cities that you get the least chance. And I come from a place which uh, the cities are developing, and not much cities are developed. So yes, yes, uh, the, qu the, the answer generally is yes. Okay. But it depends on the and, local uh, and, and so who is in charge of doing this uh, uh, politics is actually uh, listening to your hints or not? Sometimes they are. Sometimes they are, which means that sometimes they're not. Connected to his question, I have another one. That, okay, the structure of the, of the city might not be, we are not, maybe we are not able to change it in some cities, but the flow that actually are persons moving around, maybe yes. So there is a possible approach to advise how to move, uh, let's say, supermarkets or, or thinking on the social movement inside the city according to how the city is, has been built? Yes. Um, if what we did in, uh, in modularity, we did it on the topological um, aspects of the road network. If you do it on the, um, on the trips, where people start their journeys and where they end, okay, you will also see some clusters there, which shows that uh, people living in, in region A are mostly working in region B and doing their shops in region C. So as a city planner, if you start getting those nodes in long term, I mean, getting those nodes closer to each other, or introduce a shopping center closer to node A than node C, then you will uh, save many, many travel trips and travel times and fuel and congestion and pollution and things like that. So if you do the same um, research on the, on the trip part, you will get very interesting results. And th that's what we have started to do, but I don't have any results yet. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, Thank you.